We had different views of self-esteem going back to the 1970s and 1980s. These were the, the heyday of self-esteem. Here's a quotation by Nathaniel Brandon. He was a celebrity therapist who became one of the leaders of the self-esteem movement. I cannot think of a single psychological problem, from anxiety and depression, to fear of intimacy or of success, to spouse battery or child molestation, that is not traceable to the problem of low self-esteem. That was probably an overstatement even back then. But clearly a very bold statement of the idea that low self-esteem is the root of all manner of psychological problems. This sort of thinking even inspired governments and schools and other institutions. Many schools and parents and others were suddenly trying to raise their children's self-esteem. The state of California and the United States appointed a commission of experts to try uh, to raise self-esteem throughout California. They hoped that by doing this, they could address problems of drug addiction, unwanted pregnancy, crime, and much more. They even thought it was going to help balance the state's uh, budget because people with high self-esteem would earn more money and therefore pay more taxes. It didn't work. In the late 1990s, the Association for Psychological Science commissioned a group of researchers and said, OK, well, why don't you guys find out what good is high self-esteem? Do people with high self-esteem really benefit from it so that their lives are better? And so by extension, would it be worth just trying to boost everybody's self-esteem? Is this really a good thing? Should psychology be persuading uh, people in our civilization uh, to do this? So, uh, those of us on the panel, we read through thousands of uh, journal article abstracts, hundreds of articles looking for objective evidence about the possible advantages of high self-esteem. For example, we read lots of studies about school performance. Uh, school performance was one of the big original driving forces behind the self-esteem movement. This is one of the things where they thought, wouldn't it be great if, if students in school could learn better if they had higher self-esteem? Uh, in America, we're always looking for ways to uh, get students to learn their math better without actually having to do more math homework. Sure enough, the initial studies found that kids with the highest grades had higher self-esteem than the failing students. That gave rise the hope that, well, if we could raise self-esteem, that would improve learning. But psychologists had made the classic mistake of confusing correlation with causation. Self-esteem turned out to be a result, not a cause, of doing well in school. The way they found this out, they did large studies that tracked uh, students over time. Your self-esteem one year didn't lead to better grades the next year, but the other way around. Your grades one year did predict your self-esteem next year. So the grades come first, then the self-esteem. Unfortunately, that means that raising self-esteem doesn't do any good at all in terms of improving grades. Thinking you're good at math doesn't make you good at math. You really have to do the homework. Now, we looked at lots of other things, too, such as getting along with others. People with high self-esteem say, everybody loves me, I'm very popular, I have lots of friends. Even in a laboratory study where you would, say, bring in two people, uh, have them interact and get to know each other a bit, uh, and then the researchers would separate them and say, okay, rate, what do you think of that person? What do you think of that person thought of you? The person with high self-esteem says, oh, they loved me, I made a great impression. But when you look at the actual ratings, it's no difference. The other person didn't really love them. In fact, sometimes uh, the high self-esteem person is seen as egotistical and kind of annoying. Uh, so some studies have even found uh, negative reactions. But essentially, it's no difference. People with high self-esteem think others like them. Uh, it's not really true. Um, there's also lots of concern uh, among experts about uh, teenage misbehavior. And so uh, there was hope that if we could boost uh, the self-esteem of youngsters, they'll be able to say no when others try to get them to try smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol, having sex, and so on. Um, so we hope to re reduce these negative patterns among, uh, among kids. But they did giant studies tracking uh, kids along through this. Uh, it turns out first, smoking has nothing to do with self-esteem, high or low. The high self-esteem kids uh, smoke at equal levels. With alcohol, there was an effect, but it was in the wrong direction. The, it's the high self-esteem kids that are uh, more likely to try alcohol uh, earlier. And the same goes with uh, teen sex. My, my take on this, it's probably, this probably happens because the popular cool kids uh, in school, uh, they have higher self-esteem and they're more likely to be going to parties where they're drinking and uh, fooling around sexually. But in any case, the idea that boosting self-esteem would promote virginity uh, and help people abstain from alcohol, uh, the evidence says that's just wrong.